It's interesting what you notice about a city when you visit. Walking the streets of Dublin, you notice a few sounds. Like near St. Stephen's Green, where the Lewis Tram makes a stop near Grafton Street. Or at crosswalks, where the expectant beep of the pedestrian signal transitions to an urgent rhythm when it's time to move on. These sounds mix with the traditional din of a major metropolitan area, and when they do, your attention turns back to the sights of Dublin. One of the more famous features here is the incredible number of so-called Georgian homes. In certain parts of the city, they're lined up seemingly for miles. We might call them townhomes in the U.S., but these were built in the 18th century in Dublin, named for the British monarch who inspired the architectural style. The fact a defining feature of the Dublin aesthetic is named for a British king, well, there's a lot to unpack there. There are more of these homes in Dublin than any other city in Europe, largely because many in London and elsewhere were wiped out during World War II. The longest contiguous stretch of these structures is along the edge of a park called Marion Square. They aren't all homes today, obviously. Several along Marion Square are businesses, even embassies of foreign nations, given this spot's proximity to Irish Parliament and the office of the Taoiseach. And if you walk along the street here, odds are you'll notice a certain Georgian-style home. It has a bright blue door, unlike any around it. And there's a sign to the right of the entrance that reads, Daniel O'Connell, the Liberator, lived in this house. This is Notre Dame's Dublin Global Gateway, commonly known as O'Connell House. For context on its namesake, we turn to Kevin Whelan, the Gateway's director. So it's called O'Connell House. Now, Daniel O'Connell, whenever they do a poll, as they do now and again every 10 years or so, of who is the greatest Irish person, the Irish person who contributed most to Irish culture and society. And I've never seen one of those in which uh, Daniel O'Connell didn't top the list. Um, Our biggest street in Dublin is called O'Connell Street. Our biggest monument in the centre of town is the O'Connell Monument on O'Connell Bridge, uh, which is also our biggest bridge. It's as wide as it is uh, long. So, uh, you know, all the important things in Dublin, a lot of them are called after Daniel Daniel O'Connell. So everybody knows about Daniel O'Connell. And the reason why Daniel O'Connell was famous was because, and he was known in Ireland, Ireland as the liberator, but the reason for that was because Daniel O'Connell achieved full civil rights for Irish Catholics. In O'Connell's day, the Irish were subjects to the British crown, but they were not equal citizens. Far from it, in fact. O'Connell trained as a lawyer and sought to achieve full participation for Irish Catholics in society as a step toward eventual independence. The center for O'Connell's operation was his house on Marion Square. He would draft correspondence and often throw open the third-floor window and speak to thousands of people gathered in the park across the street. Which means this place is an important part of understanding Ireland, and it's one of the first places Notre Dame students who come here are acquainted with. As we found out, they still use O'Connell House as a place where knowledge is made to serve the common good. I'm Andy Fuller, and you're listening to East and West, Notre Dame in Ireland. To understand the context of Notre Dame in Ireland, you need to start at the beginning. The university's founder, Father Edward Soren, was French, of course, But it's fair to say that many, if not most, of the people who nurtured and stabilized the university at its founding, and in the years immediately after, were Irish. Years later, when the school's athletics teams took on the name the Fighting Irish, 
It was as much about repurposing an ethnic and religious slur being hurled at them as anything else. But that's another podcast for another time. The point is, the story of Notre Dame is part of the larger story of the Irish in America, a link that is alive and well today. Well, I think the simple fact of the matter is there are people alive in Ireland today because of the bipartisan support of Irish America. Mark Daly, the chair of the Irish Senate, knows this connection well. He's organizing an event of Irish and American legislators to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Peace Agreement. Uh, not just the politicians, but people at Notre Dame were involved uh, behind the scenes and often don't get the credit uh, that they deserve and actually weren't looking for the credit. And a lot of it happened because of the behind the scenes work in advance of the, the peace agreement. So I think honouring that commitment by so many people is very important. Uh, but of course, we will need uh, Irish America into the future as, as Ireland face, faces future challenges. And people, I suppose, listening need to recognise the fact that Ireland wouldn't be an independent state if it wasn't for uh, America, because the only country mentioned by name other than Ireland in our equivalent of the Declaration of Independence, the 1916 proclamation, read on the morning of the 1916 rising, uh, it says supported by our exiled children in America. And we wouldn't have peace, as I said, in Ireland without the support 24 years ago this year um, of Irish America. But then again, in 2026, we will be celebrating another anniversary together, the 250th anniversary of American independence. And George Washington, um, uh, people often take uh, democracy for granted and they take independence for granted too, because in 1776, uh, when the struggle for independence in America was in doubt and uh, the Continental Army were in retreat. Uh, my own ancestor, General Sullivan, was with George Washington in the famous mm. crossing of the Delaware, which was the last throw of the dice. Militarily, it was probably a very bad decision, okay. uh, but it worked out. But right. he had to do it because he was losing soldiers day by day because, you know, there was no momentum. Uh, and people thought that the cause was lost. But George Washington said at that time, he said, when our flag was friendless, Ireland's sons were our only friends. So as we were uh, there for America uh, 250 years ago, America has been there for Ireland ever since. Mm. How do you think Notre Dame fits into that picture of U.S.-Ireland relations? Well, I, I, I suppose it's a key f uh, builder of that relationship ever since the, the game uh, nearly 20 years ago. Uh, this year, um, you know, they built from that and, and now we have 300 Notre Dame students coming every year uh, into Ireland uh, and going back, s uh, spreading the message. So Notre Dame is, is famous in Ireland, not just for the college football, but also for the educational element. And uh, it was another US president, Thomas Jefferson, said, if you expect a country to be ignorant and free, you expect what never was and never shall be. So having uh, the education element is a key part of building uh, the relationship uh, between Ireland and America. The senator referenced the football game Notre Dame played in Croke Park in 1996. Of course, the football team would return in 2012 to play Navy. And before we move on, it may be useful to gain some perspective on that event. It represented the largest single peacetime movement of Americans into Europe. Kevin Whelan filled in some details about what that meant for Ireland. When the second game came, we had just had the crash, okay, the big crash, and we had been bailed out. We had gone from being very successful to suddenly having a major league fiscal uh, catastrophe within our public finances and banks um, collapsing or near collapsing and so on. You know, we, we had very, a very spectacular and uh, cruel uh, fall from uh, grace, right? So in 2012, the country was not quite on its knees, but it was close enough. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, without too much hype or circumstance, you know, suddenly these 30,000 Americans arrived into Ireland. Right? We had the worst weather ever all summer that summer. You know what I mean? It rained. And God is, you know, God used Ireland as his laboratory to invent rain. Did you know that? That's where he tried it out on us and he gave us all kinds of rain. Soft rain, hard rain, rain that goes in through you, rain that'll wet you, every kind of rain that uh, exists. And every one of those rains of biblical proportions fell during the summer. But guess what? 
the week of the game, we had the beautiful week of fabulous weather. <laughs> so, you know, somebody was lighting candles at the grotto and then the, um, the, uh, the crowds arrived. Taxi drivers never had a busier weekend. Something happened in Ireland that never happened in Irish history before. Pubs ran out of beer. Restaurants ran out of food. Uh, the, the whole city kind of gained from it. But also many of the Notre Dame people came a few days earlier or stayed um, a week later. They went down to the west of Ireland, they played golf, they stayed in the hotels, they hired cars, you know, and wherever you went in, uh, in Ireland that week, you couldn't not see all these um, Notre Dame people. And it gave, the, it was the first good week that we ever, we'd had in about tr three or four years. Everybody did great, and the Notre Dame people were so, um, you know, Notre Dame people are lovely. After that, everybody wanted to partner with Notre Dame. Everybody heard about Notre Dame. People, um, you know, really um, kind of felt this was brilliant. And what people always asked uh, after that was, when are you coming again? Ironically, because the Notre Dame game was so successful that everybody thought this was, uh, you know, an easy thing to kind of do. Now, there have been other American college um, football games in Dublin, but they've had nowhere near the same impact because we're the fighting Irish. We're not the fighting Welsh or the fighting Italians or the fighting Germans. Uh, we're the fighting Irish. The Notre Dame program in Dublin started in 1998, so it's celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. And clearly, many partnerships and opportunities had been formed before the Navy game. But it was the force multiplier of that game that helped to expand opportunity in Ireland for Notre Dame students. Kira, I'm a rising senior, political science, um, major with global affairs, concentration in European studies from Tulsa, Oklahoma. So. Today, the students who come here experience Ireland in all its cultural and geopolitical context. Students like Kira Fitter, who is interning at an organization called European Movement Ireland, or EMI. Yes, um, yeah, so I work for EMI. It's an NGO. Um, it really focuses on deepening the connection um, between Ireland and Europe, so whether this is informing citizens on um, EU member states or EU institutions or even what it means to be like a European citizen. So it's really focusing on building that relationship um, with European businesses or other like-minded NGOs or even just the individuals. So it's very like citizen and community focused, which I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. The goal is just um, to increase Irish involvement in European issues, I would say. Like um, increase their awareness of what's going on, get them to participate in like European elections and really just gain a sense of what it is to be European, but also maintain the Irish identity. I think that there's definitely challenges. Um, obviously, in the urban sense, you can like, oh, feel the like globalization and connection to Europe more. But like on a rural level, I think they're definitely trying to like build the connection there. But I actually think um, Ireland joining the EU has really helped their Irishness in a way. It's helped them like get become more aware of what their culture and identity is, um, also in a European context. Kira's internship is one example of the many opportunities available to students here, but it's illustrative of the collective experience in one very important way. We only do things that Irish people are interested in. If you want no Irish person goes to the Guinness factory unless they have American relatives. It's, you know, we're not going to go there. We're not going to do touristy kind of things. We're never going to set foot in Temple Bloody Bar. You know what I mean? Right. Right. right? It's not a thing that Irish people do. So I said, okay, you can do that in your own, lads, if you want to. But, like, we're going to bring you to Harland matches that are hard to get a ticket for. We're going to bring you up the top of mountains in the middle of nowhere. We're going to introduce you to people that you wouldn't be able to meet except through the connections that uh, we have. We're going to um, immerse you in our society. And whatever is going on in Dublin or Ireland, whatever Irish people are excited about or talking about, whatever is in the news, OK, that's where you're going to be. And by the time you leave our country, you're going to know well what the story is. And we're not going to sugarcoat it either. We're going to see the, the good and the bad. We're not in the happiness industry, which is tourism. You're here to enjoy yourself, but enjoying yourself is also your university student. And we introduce them to very tough things like our drug problems, say, in Dublin, or the Northern Ireland Troubles, or the realities, the harsh and sometimes cruel realities of Irish life as well. So we're not, we're not uh, selling sunset, you know, we're not, we're not trying to sell you something. 
We're trying to say, okay, want to understand Ireland? Here you go. It's a philosophy that encourages students to go off the beaten path to experience Ireland. With this in mind, we asked students where they liked to visit in Dublin. Mariana Silva, the grad student studying bogs who we met in episode two, mentioned several spots north of the River Liffey, like the National Botanic Gardens and the quaint neighborhoods of Stony Batter. We went there ourselves and happened upon a charming street festival. It was just a small reminder of the benefits of this kind of approach, learning through the soles of your feet about a different culture and your own. The students here live and study in places like Trinity College Dublin and Dublin City University, where they interact with their Irish peers. And that is its own kind of education. Over in America, nobody's going to say to you, oh, you have an American accent. The minute you open your beautiful mouths here in Dublin... People are going to say, oh, you're American. And then you are personally responsible for the Kardashians, for Donald Trump, for Joe Biden, for anything that an American... Uh, you're responsible for Elon Musk or whoever the hell is causing a controversy or fluctuate. You're responsible for cryptocurrency, whatever. You, know, you personally are responsible for that in a way that you never are in America. So our students have to learn to... Um, uh, you know, engage and discuss and do all those kind of things. You know, one of the questions that I ask him in my exam at the end is, what can Ireland learn from America? What can America learn from Ireland? And, you know, that, those are really interesting when you see what... Because, um, you know, our young people will essentially be running America in 20 years' time. And it's very um, intriguing to see what they focus on. So, like, say, over the last five years or so, they, they all think that Ireland does a better job on things like the environment than America does. I think Irish people are much more alert to recycling and cycle lanes and global warming and whatever. And our young people are very keen on those issues. I get to interact with so many more Irish people who aren't just like, you know, working in touristy areas or tour guides themselves. Like my coworkers are all Irish. And then obviously a lot of the conferences and meetings we host are with Irish citizens themselves. And it's especially been interesting. I get to meet some Irish citizens who are my age and get their different perspective and you know they have questions for me I have questions for them they're always kind of like wait you're, you're working here like what's going on there so it's it's fun to be able to like yeah engage on a more like real level I think it's definitely um has enhanced my sense of what it means to be American because I'm also learning of like oh what it means to be European um, and there are a lot of similarities, you know, become engaged citizens. Um, you should really be aware of the issues, but it's definitely interesting, like their different um, perspectives and what issues they care about. I think they're a little more fluid in their opinions and very engaged, which I would like to see, you know, in the U.S. maybe a little more. Notre Dame really gives you so many opportunities to engage globally that I don't really see at other universities. I mean, so many people study abroad or have like go in the summer to do research in a different country or um, are taking different languages and I think Notre Dame is really good at facilitating this um, idea of global citizenship and what it means to be um, connected and engaged with um, people different than you and from places different than you. Back in the National Botanic Gardens, north of Stony Batter and seemingly a world away from the Temple Bar area, there's a sacred place. It's called Glasnevin Cemetery. It's the final resting place of none other than Daniel O'Connell, the Liberator. O'Connell died in Genoa, Italy, while making a pilgrimage to Rome. His final words are carved on his grave. My body to Ireland, my heart to Rome, my soul to heaven. At the time of his death in 1847, O'Connell was working to secure help for Ireland during the Great Famine. What he couldn't know fully then, but what we know now, is that the event would set off the so-called Green Wave of Irish immigration to the United States. 
Unlike many countries at the time, the U.S. kept their ports open to harbor the Irish refugees. In turn, the Irish would help to build the country, including a small Catholic university founded just five years prior to O'Connell's death in the relative wilderness of Indiana. Perhaps it's fitting, almost poetic, that this institution now sends its young people back to Ireland to learn how to bring knowledge into service of justice in the place where the Liberator lived and in line with his legacy. We hope you enjoyed East and West, Notre Dame and Ireland. I've been your host, Andy Fuller. Original music for this series was produced by Alex Mansour. To learn more about what the university is doing in the Emerald Isle, head to nd.edu slash stories. And watch our social media platforms like at Notre Dame on Instagram for additional content this summer. Friends, thanks for listening.